Welcome. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, so I hope that you uh, that you'll be able to go and see and watch the play tonight. You is a lecturer uh, for so this is um, uh, the twenty twenty two choice for UCL classical play. Um, I hope uh, you enjoy it. And tonight, it's it's my privilege to introduce um, Isabel Torrance, Professor Isabel Torrance. Professor of Classical Reception um, at um, uh, the R. Roos Institute of Advanced Studies. Um, and she's an expert uh, on uh, many different things, actually. Um, but uh, the reason why uh, I invited her tonight um, to speak about uh, Euripides' lecture is because she's, a, she's an expert on Euripides. She's published extensively on Euripides, uh, published two books, um, one for Bloomsbury, Euripides, and another one for Oxford, Metapoetry in Euripides. Uh, but then lots of other interesting, I actually met um, Isabel as an expert on Aeschylus. So uh, there we go. So she's um, she's the right person um, to talk about Euripides lecture and sort of introduce us to the world of um, Euripides and to the place of Electra in, in, in more generally in Euripides' uh, dramatic uh, works. So uh, without further ado, um, over to you, Isabel, and thanks very much again for coming here. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, great. Um, and first of all, thank you so much to Giovanna for inviting me. I'm ecstatic to be here. It's the first time in two years that I've been able to do an in-person um, talk. So I'm really happy uh, to be here. Um, and I'm gonna be talking about the place of Electra in the broader oeuvre of Euripides, um, and also a little bit about the um, Electra's relationship to a play uh, by Aeschylus called The Libation Bearers, which is about the same mythological um, episode. Um, and at the end, I'll talk a little bit about um, Kakoyanis's film, Electra, which is sort of the um, most important modern adaptation of Euripides' play. I have a couple of references to some other modern, modern adaptations as well. Um, but I'll start with um, then um, and with the date of Euripides' Electra. And it's normally... Um, dated to, something is not working here, um, around 420 BC, um, which is, oh, it's this one here, is it? Okay, sorry. Um, which as you can see from this um, chronology of Euripides' career is roughly around the midpoint of his extant plays, um, the earliest being the Alcestis in um, 438 BCE. And the latest being Bacchae and Iphigenia at Aulis, um, both performed posthumously in 405 BCE. But we know that Euripides actually began his career um, a lot earlier than the extant Alcestis in 455 BCE, um, with a set of plays, including a tragedy called The Daughters of Peleus, about how Medea tricked the daughters of Peleus into killing their father. We also know that he won um, his first victory at the city Dionysia dramatic competitions in 441 BCE. So although, um, yeah, we, we don't know what place he entered, unfortunately, um, but basically by 420, when Electra comes out, he is about two thirds of the way through his career, which is a very long career, and he's been writing and producing plays for 35 years. So this is a mature work by a very experienced dramatist. Um, so how do we know that Electra was produced around 420? You'll notice from the um, uh, chronology that certain plays have circa beside the date and others are fixed. Um, and that's because we know the dates of some of the plays. And the other plays, um, this is sort of a bit of philological trivia, which I think is kind of exciting, so I wanted to share it with you, um, were calculated um, uh, through this sort of um, remarkable discovery by this late 19th, early 20th century philologist, uh, Polish um, scholar called Tadeusz um, Zylinski. And he discovered, he studied all of the plays of Euripides and he scanned them all. So as I'm sure you know, the Greek plays are written in meter. So um, what we call the spoken parts of Greek tragedy are actually written in iambic trimeters. 
and excuse me, um, and then the choral parts are written in lyric meters. And so this is the basic scheme of an iambic trimeter. Um, the first beat is either long or short, um, and then you have long, short, long, and it's repeated three times, um, hence trimeter. And what Silinski discovered from studying um, the fixed dates um, for the plays of Euripides was that um, over the course of his career, Euripides changed his metrical scheme to include more resolutions. And what that means is that you have one long that is transformed into two short syllables. So it makes a sort of a more um, excited meter. Um, and this was consistent over the course of Euripides' career. So he then went back and studied the plays for which we didn't have any dates um, and was able to chart a sort of rough estimate of when they were produced. So although this is sort of a, a tedious um, uh, philological process, which I'm, I mean, I don't envy somebody having to do that, it actually has an incredibly important um, impact on being able to reconstruct um, the sequence of Euripides' plays. For example, with Sophocles' plays, we're much more at a loss about when they were uh, produced. We don't know what plays accompanied um, the um, Electra, uh, but we do know that it responds directly to Aeschylus' libation bearers. We don't know whether Sophocles' Electra was earlier or later than Euripides either. Um, and the libation bearers of Aeschylus, um, as I mentioned, deals with the same episode of, uh, of the mythology, the descendants of, of Agamemnon. And Euripides' Electra is quite famous for its references to Aeschylus because it's very marked in this regard. So Electra in Euripides directly ridicules the kind of recognition tokens that Aeschylus had exploited in his version of the recognition scene between Electra and Orestes. So we have a very direct intertextual reference, and I'll come back to the recognition scene later on. But for the moment, I wanted to make two observations about how that fits into Euripides over more broadly. Uh, first of all, the Aristia trilogy by Aeschylus, that is the Agamemnon, the Libation Bearers, and the Eumenides tragedies, all had a huge impact on Euripides. And he comes back to that trilogy again and again. Um, so this connected trilogy, the Aristia, was Aeschylus's final masterpiece. It was produced in 458 BCE, which was just three years before Euripides first entered the city Dionysia competition himself. Um, and Electra is the first of our extant engagements with the Aristia. But um, if we look at the um, plays we have um, from the extant plays, Iphigenia among the Taurians, Orestes, which is produced in 408 BC, so actually on the 50th anniversary of um, the uh, Aristia, um, and also Iphigenia at Aulis. So we're incredibly unfortunate, we're incredibly fortunate to have these interrelated texts compared to each other. Um, and um, how have these plays survived? Well, they also come down to us in two separate groups. Um, we have 10 plays that come down to us in multiple manuscript copies. Um, these are apparently selected as the highlights of Euripides' oeuvre, um, the texts that were most frequently copied out by scribes. And those plays are the Alcestis, Medea, Hippolytus, Andromache, Hecuba, Trojan women, Phoenician women, um, Orestes, Bacchae. And there's one play called Rhesus that was attributed to Euripides' antiquity, but is not believed to be by him. And then nine further plays have survived far more accidentally. Um, these are a group of alphabetically organized dramas whose Greek titles begin with the letters Epsilon, so that's Helen, Helene, um, Ada, Heracles, Heracles, the children of Heracles, Heraclidae, and Electra, um, Electra, Iota, so we have suppliant women, Hecatides, Iphigenite Aulus, Iphigenite among the Taurians, Ion, and Kappa, Cuclops, the Cyclops. So Electra survives in this accidental group in this one manuscript that's sort of excerpted from an alphabetical compendium of Euripides' plays. Um, and as classicists, then we have to deal with what survives without quite knowing the whole picture. And Electra may seem to be quite radical in its intertextuality with Aeschylus. 
Um, but we have three other Euripidean tragedies that riff off of the Aristia. And in fact, when we look more closely at the works and fragments of Aeschylus and also Sophocles, we can see that this kind of riffing is something that Euripides does very frequently. For example, um, in Euripides' um, Phoenician Women, um, which dramatizes the same mythological episode as Aeschylus's Seven Against Thebes. This is the siege um, of Thebes by um, the attacking army. We have a character um, in Euripides that makes a statement that seems to challenge Aeschylean dramatic technique. So basically in Aeschylus' Seven Against Thebes, a very large portion of the play is spent describing the attackers their armies and the shield designs of the champions leading the armies. And in Euripides' version, um, you have um, the same character, Ateocles, he's the, the, the prince of Thebes, um, who says when the army is encircling um, the city, and the quote is on the slide, um, it would be a waste of time to name each one of the enemy stationed as they are under our very walls. So a little bit of a joke, a little bit of a um, poke at Aeschylus and his earlier version of the play. Um, and at the same time, although he sort of criticizes apparently this um, technique, later in the play, we have a messenger speech in Euripides, which does exactly that. It describes the army leaders and their shield designs. Um, in a pattern where images from Aeschylus are transformed into a physical embodiment in Euripides. So, for example, in Euripides, um, Polynices, one of the attacking champions, is described as an outlined form, so I use this kind of artistic language, wearing golden armor. Um, and that is basically um, a, a, a physical embodiment of the image of Polynices on the shield in Aeschylus. So in Aeschylus, he has a shield with an image of an outline of a man in a golden armor. So Euripides basically brim, brings the Aeschylean image to life in a real figure. And he does it also with this figure, uh, Capaneus, who in Euripides is intent on scaling the walls of Thebes. And you can see in this vase painting, which is thought to be related to this saga, um, a character here scaling up and um, the um, defenders trying to stab down at him with their spears. Um, again, this is a sort of physical manifestation of an image described in Aeschylus on one of the shields where there is an armed man trying to scale the city walls. Um, so, Aeschylean imagery is validated in this play, um, even though his technique has been implicitly questioned. And that's exactly what we find in Electra, where the recognition tokens of Aeschylus are rejected, but ultimately validated because they do signal the return of Orestes. Um, and I'll come back to the recognition scene in Electra in a little bit, um, uh, but I just want to give you a couple more examples so that you can see how common this is in Euripides. Um, that he um, engages with these other great masters and tries to create his own riff on um, a mythological plot. Um, so if we look at Euripides Andromache, which we know replays the same myth as Sophocles' lost Hermione, we have a reversal of characterization. So Euripides takes the Hermione, who is a damsel in distress in Sophocles, and makes her very unsympathetic. Um, in his Hecuba, which tells the same episode as Sophocles' lost Polyxena, so we can tell this from the fragments of the, the lost plays, um, basically a little bit about the plot and what happened, Euripides creates an additional tragedy. So he gives us a sort of double whammy. Instead of just having one child die, so the story of Polyxena is about her sacrifice at the tomb of Achilles, um, after the Trojan War. She's the daughter of Hecuba. In Euripides' Hecuba, we have the sacrifice of Polyxena, but we also have the death of her son, Polydorus. So she loses two children instead of one. And then in our only surviving satyr play, um, which is, uh, you know, um, 
determined by having this chorus of, of satyrs dancing around and, you know, we have uh, sex jokes and, um, you know, behaving badly. Um, Euripides' Cyclops, which retells the story of the um, uh, 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 giant um, Cyclops Polyphemus in Odyssey 9, riffs off that Homeric episode by, instead of presenting uh, Cyclops, who sort of bashes the men out against the rocks and eat them raw, Euripides has a very sophisticated Cyclops who has, you know, been to butchery school and who cooks them up nice and neatly and um, makes a nice uh, uh, fancy dinner out of them. Um, so throughout Euripides' work, he's constantly referring back to um, other uh, great masters and trying to place himself within that tradition. Um, so this is something that happens very markedly in um, Euripides' Electra. And um, in a way, it's sort of difficult for modern audiences to maybe um, under appreciate that about him, which is why I decided to talk about this for, for my talk. And now I turn to this recognition scene. And so I first sort of summarize the recognition scene in the libation bearers so that you can see then what Euripides does in his Electra. And I've put the, um, um, the Greek and um, English side by side. This is Alan Summerstein's text and translation in case any of you uh, read Greek, but I'll just summarize and point out the important lines. So in Aeschylus, Electra arrives at the tomb of Agamemnon and she sees a lock of hair at the tomb, line 168, and decides that it looks very similar to her own, line 176. The chorus therefore conclude um, with Electra, that the hair belongs to Orestes because it looks similar to hers. Electra then notices footprints, um, which she um, again claims are, um, oh, so sorry, that was where um, they noticed they belonged to her own. And then um, this is the footprints around 205 to six, which she claims are similar to her own and they match the outline of her own feet when she measures them at the end, 209 to 10. And Orestes then reveals himself, proves his identity with a piece of weaving, line 231, which is the work of Electra's own hand and is embroidered with the image of a beast. Um, and that's at 231 to 232. In Euripides' Electra, um, Orestes and Pylades, and um, again, I give you the... Um, uh, here we go the um, text and translation of David Kovach. In Euripides' Electra, um, Orestes and his friend Pylades arrive at the house of the impoverished Electra and her former husband um, and are not recognized. An old manservant fav faithful to Agamemnon, who's come from Agamemnon's tomb, then arrives with news. He says he's found a lock of hair on Agamemnon's tomb and urges Electra to compare the lock of hair to her own to see if the color is the same, as he says this would indicate the return of Orestes as a blood relation. So this is section 515 um, to 23 over the page. Um, so Electra first retorts that Orestes would not have returned out of fear of Aegisthus by stealth. This is 224 to six. And then she says, how can the hair of a young man raised in wrestling, wrestling schools be the same as mine, which is feminine and combed? She also points out that many people have similar hair color, even if they're not related. So this idea that she should compare her lock of hair um, to the one on uh, the tomb is absolutely rejected. The old man tries a different angle. Step into his footprint, he says, at um, 5.32 to 3 and see whether the mark of his shoe is the same size, um, and the word there is sumetros as her own foot. So sumetros in Greek means of the same measure, but also means of the same meter. So we have like a poetic joke that he's sort of saying, you're pretty saying, hey, look at my recognition scene. Is it of the same meter? Is it the same poetry as Aeschylus, right? Um, Electra raises two problems. How could a footprint be made on rocky ground? And even if there is a, feet, a footprint, the feet of siblings will not be the same size. The male sibling will have the larger foot. Fair enough. 
the old man tries something else. Can you guess what it is? He asks about a piece of weaving. Yes, specifically he asks, is there a piece of weaving um, by which Electra might recognize Orestes? Some piece of weaving that he might have been wrapped in when he was stolen away um, so that he would avoid death. And that's 538 to 40. Electra chides the old man, she says. She was a child when Orestes went into exile and so presumably unable to weave. And she adds sarcastically that even if she had been able to weave, how would he still be wearing this weaving unless he grew with his clothes? Another sarcastic joke. Um, Electra concludes that some sympathetic foreigners must have left the offerings while the old man starts asking about the guests who have arrived and then recognizes Orestes by a scar on his eyebrow that he had sustained as a child while chasing a fawn with his sister, Electra. Everybody following me? <laughs> Excellent. And then Electra accepts her brother's identity immediately. So this is at, um, um, yeah, so five, uh, seven, three to four um, here. So, Clearly, the recognition tokens of Aeschylus are referenced and rejected. Orestes is ultimately recognized by the older recognition trope of the scar, as, in, um, as Odysseus is in the Odyssey, right? However, the fact remains that the lock of hair and the footprint do in fact signal the return of Orestes, and the old man was right about that. So this is what makes the scene both challenging and radical. What is going on here? And why does Electra resist um, recognizing her brother? Um, the late David Rayburn, who has this wonderful article on the props and um, uh, stagecraft of Euripides Electra, suggested that Electra resists recognizing Orestes because that would, quote, undermine the basis of her life as she has come to live it. In other words, Electra is sort of addicted to her misery and maintains an attitude of denial that could explain her behavior. And this kind of attitude is something that one modern instantiation of Electra comments on, albeit in relation to Clytemnestra, the mother. Um, that character is Elaine, the Electra figure in Marina Carr's 2002 play Ariel, which is based on the Aristia and Electra and Iphigenia plays, sort of all mushed in together and this is one of the reasons why the reception history of a play like Euripides Electra is basically impossible to chart because it's completely tangled up with um, the reception history of the other plays on this um, myth. So Marina Carr is um, one of the most successful contemporary Irish playwrights. She frequently rewrite, rewrites Greek tragedies. And in this play, Ariel, which is also the um, uh, name of the Iphigenia figure, um, Elaine, the Electra figure, claims to know one thing about sorrow and have learned it by watching her mother. Sorrow, she says, is an addiction like no other. And she says to her mother, you won't be full till you've buried us all. And that phrase, I think, could well be applied to Euripides' own Electra. And in fact, if we look a bit more closely at Electra's arguments in the recognition scene, there are some problems there too, because in the beginning of the play, we hear from Electra's husband, the farmer, that there's a bounty on Orestes' head with a reward of gold offered to anyone who kills him. So if Orestes is in exile with a bounty on his head, how else is he supposed to come back with any chance of success except by stealth? So remember Electra had said, um, there's no way my brother would come back by stealth, but it doesn't really make sense for him to come um, any other way. She also said, if you remember, that she had combed feminine hair that wouldn't match um, the hair of a man. But earlier in the play, she had complained that her hair was filthy and cropped. Um, and this idea that Electra has cropped hair is very much in keeping with the idea that she's in constant mourning for her father. Um, this is a vase painting, which is related to the tomb seen in Aeschylus' Libation Bearers. Um, uh, but the figure on the right-hand side um, at the back with the sort of, sort of shorter hair, that's Electra, who has markedly shorter hair than Orestes on the left, who is cutting a lock of hair. 
And this is the kind of thing that could be really played up in performance. If you remember that, of course, all Greek actors were male, but they wore these full head masks. Um, and so uh, you could really play on that with Electra mask, maybe even looking a little bit like Orestes's mask, the hairstyles being similar, and that would completely undermine what she says in the recognition scene. Of course, there are different ways to play that. But Euripides was infamous for, um, well, according to parodies in Aristophanes, the comic poet, for presenting royal characters in a debased state. In his um, Aristophanes Acharnians and Frogs comedies, Euripides is made fun of for presenting his characters in rags. Um, so this is also something typical about Euripides, the idea that his royalty is in a debased state. Another non sequitur of the recognition scene. If the old man is the one who saved Orestes, as we're told, why doesn't he know that there's no piece of weaving, um, as, you know, Electra sort of emphatically explains. The reference to a piece of weaving is very obviously contrived. So Electra refuses to play along with the traditional script. She is, or at least appears, incapable of interpreting the tokens in accordance with poetic convention. Not only does she refuse to acknowledge the potential significance of the lock of hair in the footprint, she also fails to notice Orestes scar, even though she had been present as a child um, when he uh, sustained um, the injury. Similarly, after, sorry about this plot spoiler, the murder of Aegisthus, I'm sure you all know that people are going to die, but anyway, um, after the murder of Aegisthus, Electra is wondering what happened, um, and she starts wondering um, and saying, lamenting that there are no messengers. And this is the precise moment in a Greek tragedy where you would expect a messenger to turn up with the news. So she says, oh, there are no messengers, and then immediately, of course, a messenger does turn up, um, uh, but she doesn't recognize the, the servant, even though he's a servant from her own household. Um, so we, she repeatedly draws attention to these dramatic conventions. And I, I come back to the recognition scene itself. The sequence has really troubled scholars for many generations, um, so much so that some scholars um, sought to remove uh, whole sections of text on the grounds that they were interpolations um, added after the fact and they weren't genuinely by Euripides. Current scholarly consensus is that they are genuine. And my own opinion is actually that they're emblematic of Euripides' technique throughout his oeuvre, which is why I've tried to give you some other examples of um, how he does this elsewhere. But they do deserve special consideration, I think. This is something really special about Euripides' Electra. Um, because we have this whole a play to which they refer that still survives. But what is Euripides actually doing? If he's criticizing Aeschylus's tokens as unrealistic, why does his own character present problematic arguments and erroneous conclusions? If he's trying to present a new and better way of doing a recognition scene, why does he go back to the Odyssey and Scar? Um, and if he's parodying Aeschylus, why are the tokens ultimately validated. They do, in fact, signal Orestes' return. The footprint was made by Orestes. The lock of hair was dedicated by Orestes. And I think that if we read the scene as a metatheatrical commentary, as an invitation to reflect on the conventions of dramatic production in classical Greek antiquity, these questions are no longer really important. It's not so much that Aeschylus is right or wrong, it's rather the convention of the recognition scene itself that's brought under, under scrutiny. These marked moments of metatheatricality are a significant and distinctive aspect of Euripides' oeuvre. Um, in another example from the Agamemnon story, Euripides' Agamemnon literally tries to rewrite the script at the opening of um, Iphigenia at Aulis. Um, at the beginning of this play, so I'm sure you all know, um, uh, Agamemnon at Aulis um, has written home to his wife Clytemnestra to tell her to bring their daughter Iphigenia to Aulis um, so that she can marry Achilles. But actually, he's planning to offer her as a human sacrifice to Artemis. And at the beginning of Euripides Iphigenia at Aulis, Agamemnon has had a terrible 
um, crisis of conscience. And he's literally writing home to say, don't come, don't come, the wedding is off. Um, because he's just decided he can't go through with sacrifice. The letter gets intercepted and the um, sacrifice ends up going ahead. Um, Iphigenia finds out about it and she decides to go willingly to her death. Um, but the point is that this is another instance of um, Euripides kind of trying to uh, sort of playing with derailing the mythological tradition. Um, he does this sort of going one step further in his plot of Iphigenia among the Taurians, where Iphigenia is believed dead by all the Greeks after the sacrifice, um, but she's actually been saved by Artemis and um, uh, put down in an obscure location on the Black Sea coast where she's really miserable and pining for home. Um, and this vase image shows the transformation of Iphigenia into a deer at the moment that she's been saved by uh, Artemis. Um, and actually that play Iphigenia among the Taurians also uh, reworks the recognition tokens from Aeschylus' libation bearers, because in the recognition scene between Orestes and Iphigenia, um, there is a piece of weaving designed by Iphigenia that um, enables the recognition scene to occur, and a lock of hair um, that was cut for her sacrifice at Aulis, um, which serve as verbal proofs rather than physical tokens. Um, so along the lines of this derailing of mythology, we also have the conclusion of Euripides' Electra. Because at the very end of the play, and it's not really a plot spoiler, um, uh, it's just a sort of, it's a, an addendum that happens at the end of the play. So I hope you won't mind me pointing it out. Um, um, the Dioscori, Castor and, and Pollux turn up at the end of the play. Um, and they basically refute the entire myth on which the play has been based by revealing that the Trojan War was fought for a phantom sent by Zeus to cause strife and death. So this story is developed by Euripides in his Helen, which is dated to 412. So that's later, eight years later than this circa 420 Euripides Electra. And what does that mean? Um, that means that there was um, no Helen who caused the Trojan War. It was a phantom. Um, this, um, extended 10-year war happened for nothing. There were no weapons of mass destruction. That's basically the story. So um, many scholars have focused on um, the realism um, of Euripides and realism or rationalism, you know, with his questioning of, for example, the recognition tokens is certainly an important feature of his plays. Electra asks rational questions about logically unfeasible plot twists. But what's more important for Euripides, in my opinion, is the metatheatricality of it all. He wants the audience to think about how clever and innovative he's been in relation to the great masters. And we get that sense again at both earlier and later points in Electra. Um, Electra's entrance with a water vessel in Euripides. I don't know what's going to happen in the play tonight. So I'm just talking about, you know, what's been extrapolated from the ancient text. Um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what, what they've done with it. But um, in the original, Electra enters with a water vessel, um, which must have recalled the entry of the Aeschylean Electra who carried a water vessel. So there's this visual intertextuality, if you like, visual um, engagement with the previous plays. Um, it's been argued that they both plays featured similar dances with um, the vessel positioned on Electra's head. And similarly, when Clytemnestra arrives at Electra's house, um, she arrives, I'm gonna give you an image of the scene from Kakoyanis' film here on the left. This is Clytemnestra arriving at the house of Electra. Um, she arrives in splendor in a carriage with Trojan slaves and is lured inside to her death. And this uh, visually reflects the pattern of Aeschylus's Agamemnon, when Agamemnon come home from the Trojan War with his Trojan slaves in splendor in a carriage to the palace and dismounts to go inside. Um, and um, I would further add that um, the very point of setting Euripides Electra in this smoke-soiled shack of the poor but noble farmer 
seems inspired by an Aeschylean choral passage, which I've put on the screen. So in Electra, when Clytemnestra arrives, Electra warns her not to dirty her clothes on the, the sort of smoky, sooty walls of the house. Um, and the language um, recalls this passage in Aeschylus where justice shines forth from smoke-soiled dwellings and honors the righteous man. Because the issue of the legitimacy of the matricide um, is something that comes into play very much in Euripides. So we could say that it is presented as justified in intertextual terms in relation to Aeschylus. It sort of uh, works out an Aeschylean justice. But what about the sort of more modern in Euripides' generation, moral and ethical considerations? So at the end of the play, Castor declares that um, uh, Apollo's command to Orestes that he had to commit matricide was unwise. Um, and he instructs Orestes to stand trial at Athens. So human understanding of the world is entirely at odds with the divine plan. Um, and this is another consistent feature across Euripides' oeuvre. His characters very frequently question the oracles, the nature, and even the existence of the gods in their traditional forms, generally with very persuasive and logical arguments, only to be proven wrong, so to speak, at the end, when a god appears from the machine to tie up all the loose ends and to tell everyone what to do. Um, and again, scholars have been very perplexed by this aspect of Euripides, the apparently contradictory nature of Euripidean theology. But again, I would argue that the whole point of presenting conflicting ideas about the gods is to generate reflection and debate among the audience. So in the case of Electra, we are left to consider if it can ever be morally and ethically justifiable to commit homicide or matricide. Um, and with the immediate regret of the siblings, we're left to consider the devastating impact of the crimes and whether it's right to obey religious decrees unquestioningly. So these kinds of moral and ethical dilemmas, I think, can speak to modern audiences. Um, and Euripides' characters in Electra are um, less straightforward, sort of messier, um, if you like, more identifiably human, perhaps, um, and less stock types than their counterparts in Aeschylus and Sophocles. So Electra is arguably more annoying and unpleasant than heroic. Um, and um, the characters are uh, interestingly complex for a modern audience. So yes, her plight is pitiable. She's in a terrible state, but she doesn't, for example, seem to appreciate the kindness and respect of her husband. And she doesn't seem to accept the help of her friends when they try to help, for example, the chorus, try to help her um, lend her some fine clothes, and she declines. She's obsessed with her hatred. She can't move on. Um, and there's an unpleasant scene in which she abuses the dead body of Aegisthus. And also the manner in which Aegisthus dies is, um, and he's murdered um, by Orestes, as I'm sure you know, is deeply unheroic. Aegisthus is literally stabbed in the back um, while he's offering a sacrifice to which he had invited Orestes to join as a guest. Um, so it's a great violation of the bond of um, guest-host relation. Um, and Clytemnestra also is lured to her death through a deceptive abuse of the bond of motherhood. And she's um, uh, Electra playing on her maternal, um, whatever maternal uh, feelings she still has. So the um, crimes are complex. They're not straightforward. Yes, they've been ordained by the gods, but the manner in which they play out is problematic. And um, Aegisthus and Electra are also not straightforwardly villainous in the sense that they have come to regret their past crimes. So there's uh, some kind of room for um, sympathy in the treatment of them. But again, it also depends on how the performance is directed. So I'm, I don't know how it will, it will go this evening. Um, there are very few, as I mentioned, direct adaptations of Electra. And I'm just going to, um, if I have a couple of minutes, um, talk about uh, Kakoyanis' Electra um, very briefly. Um, so Michael Kakoyanis is a, um, 
uh, Greek Cypriot director was, I should say, who was most famous for his 1964 film Zorba the Greek, um, but also well known for this so-called trilogy of Euripidean films, um, the first of which was Electra, 1962, followed by Trojan Women and Iphigenia. And then the films aren't a trilogy in any real sense of connection. They're just three Euripidean plays. Um, the first and the, the last are in uh, Greek, in modern Greek. Um, the Trojan Women is in English and um, Electra is shot entirely in black and white. So there's some very significant differences between them. Um, but they share um, the absence of the gods. That's also very common in modern um, adaptations. So Kakoyanis um, focuses on human responsibility and consequences rather than uh, on you know, the gods decrees. Um, Kakoyanis, um, interestingly, uh, sort of, um, I don't know what the best word is, he sort of uh, detangles or disentangles the complexity of the European characters a little bit. So his Electra is a bit more straightforwardly sympathetic. Um, for example, she's manhandled by Aeschylus, by Aegisthus's um, henchman. And um, also with Orestes, um, he's more sympathetic because, um, you know, Aegisthus is presented as this drunken, debauched character, and he's murdered at this feast in which he's behaving badly instead of um, you know, while he's sacrificing to the gods as in, as in Electra. Um, and Aegisthus and Clytemnestra are also kind of more awful in the film than, um, than in Euripides. Um, so he does take a, a little bit of, of the complexity out of the characters. But one thing he does very strikingly is he represents the murder of Clytemnestra in um, a series of visual frames that progress in a sort of very stylized and extended fashion. So um, we have a much more of a sense of the murder in, in taking place in the film than we do in, in um, Euripides. And it's after the matricide that the chorus of women um, lose sympathy for the siblings. So throughout the film, the, the, the main characters, Electra and Orestes, have been supported by the community. And after the matricide, the community abandons them and they three go their separate ways into exile at the end. And the film was very much celebrated at its release and has been um, discussed um, in, um, um, in this book by Pantelis Michalakis, Greek Tragedy on Screen, with, along with other films. Um, and one of the quotes that um, Michalakis uh, brings into his discussion comes from a review contemporary review by classicist Hugh Lloyd-Jones. Um, and he said um, that he felt Kakoyanis had captured the essence of Euripides. And he says of Euripides that Euripides is not putting forward moral views. He is not judging his characters. He is simply exploiting a narrative and letting the dilemma speak for itself. The film brings this out. So I would wholeheartedly agree with that assessment of Euripides in, in what he does throughout his oeuvre. Um, it sort of reinforces the point I've been trying to make. Um, where scholars struggle um, with contradictions in Euripides, it's my opinion that it's because they're looking for a uniform, unified sort of voice of Euripides. What did Euripides um, think about these things? And again, I think those are the wrong questions to ask um, because Euripidean drama consistently flies contradictions within social and political viewpoints, within belief systems, within dramatic devices, in order to, quote, let the dilemma speak or the contradiction speak for itself, let the audience um, debate and decide for themselves. So Euripides' Electra as a whole um, blurs several boundaries between peasant and royalty, questions the nature of nobility. The most admirable character in the play is easily the poor and unnamed farmer, while all the royals behave despicably. And um, in a way, that issue could be made relevant to any time period, royals behaving despicably. One or two come to mind. Um, alternatively, dynastic squabbles and Electra's rejection by the royal household 
in today's world might bring to mind contemporary Middle Eastern princesses who have fallen out of favor with their own royal household and have been imprisoned or confined. For example, the Saudi princess uh, Basma bin Saud was just recently released from jail, apparently after being held for three years without charge. And the reason those examples came to mind um, is uh, uh, because of this last um, adaptation that I'll mention, um, a novel um, by Irish novelist Colm Tobin, um, who is most famous for his novel and film Brooklyn. Um, but in 2017, he wrote this novel, House of Names, which is based on all of the plays uh, dealing with this myth. And he um, sort of sets it in a very identifiably sort of Mediterranean, but slash Middle Eastern context. Um, and he uh, reported in an interview having been inspired by the Syrian president and his wife, um, Bashar and Asma al-Assad in his representation of Agamemnon and Clytemnestra. So, and in his retelling, he sort of casts a much broader complex network of social and political intrigues, demonstrating how numerous individuals and groups can become drawn into these webs of conflict. And of course, that's something you can do in a novel that you can't do in a play. Um, he was also inspired by um, the Civil War in Northern Ireland, King's Mill Massacre, for example. Um, but so in spite of Electra being really quite tied to its original context through its marked intertextuality with Aeschylus, there is potential for suggestive adaptation, even if this is one of Euripides' least performed plays. Um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing the UCL production this evening. And thanks for listening to my ramblings. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Isabel. We do have time for one, one or two questions. If you, there's, I mean, there's, there's lots of lots of different things that you've touched upon, and and that I think you should look out for in the performance tonight. Uh, amongst which, the, I think you you, you said realism of uh, Euripides' realism, and um, part of that realism, I think, is also translates into the um, humour. Um, in in the first part of um, in the first part of the play, um, mm -hmm. especially. Um, so I don't know if you would agree, but Euripides is kind of one of the or thought to be one of the precursors of new comedy. Oh yeah, yeah, um, oh, absolutely, so, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's also that's something to uh, that's something to look out for tonight. And then uh, the other thing that I so you talked extensively about the recognition scene and um, uh, and how it riffs off um, other recognition scene and and the other retellings of the myth and and another uh, this is more of a question than a comment it's Orestes right because Orestes also doesn't reveal himself right. uh, for a very long time yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he doesn't even in the end uh, do the do the actual deed of being of, of revealing himself so it has to be someone else uh, to uh, to do that so I, I completely agree with you on, on the lecture um, and, and, and that was really interesting, but also Orestes is, is, is quite an interesting, um, uh, it's quite interesting that he doesn't want to be recognized in a sense. Yeah, yeah, and it, it makes you, when, and when you see that in performance, um, I think that that's also the case in Sophocles, Electra, that it, there's a really long time, um, and when he's on stage, you kind of really kind of start to feel for Electra that you know he's she, he's kind of dragging it out and he's not revealing himself when you know he, it's perfectly safe to do so as well mm -hmm. right because he sort of knows he's among friends um, and so it sort of makes you feel a little bit for Electra and it could and it again depends how it's played but it could be played in a sort of a, a little bit of a cruel way that you know he he doesn't trust her or he doesn't care enough or you know he's not sort of running up to her saying oh my long lost sister i'm here to save the day um and actually in euripides electra this sort of uh responsibility equally split between the siblings or the burden of the crimes is really on both of them it's not like he the man is doing all of the the planning and and, and criminal action electra has a large role to play in um making sure that everything goes ahead so i think that's a heavy burden on both of them and and, and makes the play a bit uncomfortable i suppose mm -hmm. yeah yeah uh, i'm actually working for the last few years on uh, exclusively on um the reception of uh, classical culture in ireland 
So <laughs> I've, uh, yeah, it's been exciting for me to come and talk about Euripides, um, which I haven't done for a while. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much again, Isabel. And um, yeah, yeah, thanks a lot I for hope coming. you enjoyed tonight. Yeah.